elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said this man cast saith ceases not to, to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law for we have heard we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall, shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And read verse 1 of chapter 7. Then the high priest, are these saying so? And he said, men. Hang on. Okay. Now from verse 2 to verse 47 of chapter 7, Stephen reminds the Sanhedrin, this is the their history, the general conference, okay? <laughs> and I'm not speaking about general conference, I'm just saying that this is the highest religious body in that day. He reminds them of their history, their relationship with God from when? Deuteronomy chapter 7. To the present time. And there's no problem. There's no problem. They say, yeah, you're right, man. We, we understand our history. Keep going. And he does. And that's the problem. Now, we get to verse 48. Of chapter 7. Who would like to read verses 48, 49, and 50 of chapter 7? Okay. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me? says the Lord. Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? What is what is Stephen doing here? He actually, in the last two verses, he's quoting Isaiah. He's quoting Isaiah chapter 62, 66, verses 1 and 2. Yep. Again, what? Reminding them or documenting from Scripture everything that he said. Now, would you read very carefully, deliberately, verses 51 through 53. Now, he connects what Israel, how Israel has reacted to God's leading in the past, and he now applies it to Israel's behavior. To whom? The present time. To the Messiah. Please, would you read verses 51? You stiff naked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you may have, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. Who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Thank you. So what has he done? He's reminded them from the time of Solomon to what? To the present time. How they have resisted God. Folks, there's an object, there's, there's an object lesson here for us. Acts chapter 7, 54 through 60. Who would like to volunteer to read verses 54 through 60 of Acts chapter 7? Okay? Tom? Okay. Or Linda? Either one. You fight among yourselves. <laughs> I found mine. Okay. 
Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. By the way, have you ever seen an adult grinding their teeth because they were so upset? Yes. That's quite a scene, huh? Yes. That is quite a scene. Please continue. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears, and they rushed upon him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside the robe at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having this, he fell asleep. We're being told today that it's impossible to die to self. But you just got through reading an example in history where one man was so dead to self and concerned with his murderers stoning him to death that he asked God, please don't hold this against him. Wow. Now, if that, not, if that is not 100% dying to self, I don't know what is. Amen. So we have biblical evidence here that it's possible to die to self. The question is, what motivates us? That's the question. It's motivation. Now, the author of a book that we're studying for the next 14 weeks makes a decision. And he decides that he is going to emulate what the religious leaders have just done to Stephen. So what does he do? But he's haunted by his thoughts. Turn to chapter 9. Relax. Let's find out from Scripture what happens here. Acts chapter 9. Who would like to read the first three verses? Ricky? Sure. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters for him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Thank you. God did not destroy Israel when they crucified Jesus. He did not reject them. But when they rejected the gospel by stoning Stephen to death, that is when God said, okay, I have given you ample time to consider what I've tried to get you to focus on, which is the gospel, because that is the gospel right there in those three verses. And they rejected it. And now, the author of our book that we're studying this quarter says, hey, I'm going to go out and talk what the religious leaders in Jerusalem have done. I'm going to get letters of approval from the religious leaders to go to Damascus and visit every synagogue in Damascus and identify each of these Jesus followers and then I'm going to process them legally the same way that the religious leaders in Jerusalem did. And we're going to wipe these people out. That's the author of the book that we're studying. Now, God had other plans. So what happens in verses 4 through 6 of Acts chapter 9? 
Who would like to read that for us? Carl. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Thank you. Do you know what goats are? They're a bush that grows in the Middle East with thorns that long. And what Jesus is saying is, in a parable, why do you, and they have sandals, they did not have covered shoes, why with your open toes do you keep kicking against the thorns of the gold bush? What is wrong with you? When are you going to get it? Have you noticed as you study your Bible that God makes it very, very difficult for you to go in the wrong direction? Huh? Let me read a statement to you from uh, Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page 139. Quote, all along the road that leads to eternal death, there are pains and penalties there are sorrows and disappointments. There are warnings not to go on this direction. God's love has made it hard for the heedless and headstrong to destroy themselves. End quote. <laughs> and that is what Jesus is doing here with the author of the book that we're studying for the next 14 weeks. The material that I'm sharing with you was taken from chapters 12, 13, 14 of Acts of the Apostles. Let me read to you a little bit. This is from page 115, Acts of the Apostles. Title of the chapter is From Persecutor to Disciple. Let's see how good a job Jesus did in recruiting the author of our book. Saul now saw that in persecuting the followers of Jesus, he had in reality been doing the work of Satan. He saw that his convictions of right and of his own duty had been largely based on his implicit confidence in the priests and rulers. <coughs> Someday Jesus is going to come back and he's going to say, Chuck, what did you do with what I gave you here? If I respond to Jesus' question by saying, well, Jesus, you know that my intellect is, you know, not too high, and I don't have much of an education. So I went to theologian Tutti Frutti, and I asked him to explain it to me. And he did. And so I accepted it. And Jesus is going to say, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, what did you personally, can you read, Chuck? Yeah, I can read. What did you personally do with the information I gave you here? Well, Jesus, I don't know if you've heard about this. But I was privileged to go to a church with a pastor, the funniest guy you ever heard speak. And when he got through speaking, you felt so good, and you were laughing and saying, wow, wow, and hardly quit to come back. And Jesus says, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, what did you personally do with this book called the Bible? The only answer that's acceptable is for me to say, Lord, you know my intellectual limitations and educational limitations. So I got on my knees and asked the Holy Spirit to give me the understanding that I was capable of receiving. And to the best of my ability, I surrendered self and I asked the Holy Spirit to reproduce your character. And you know what Jesus is going to say? Well done, that good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy.
that is the only answer that is acceptable from Scripture. Continuing to read. <clears throat> Saul had believed them, the religious leaders, when they told him that the story of the resurrection of Jesus was an artful fabrication of the disciples of Jesus. Now that Jesus himself stood revealed, Saul was convinced of the truthfulness of the claims made by Jesus' disciples. In that hour of heavenly illumination, Saul's mind acted with remarkable rapidity. The prophetic records of Holy Writ were open to his understanding. He saw that the rejection of Jesus by the religious leaders, his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, had been foretold by the prophets and proved him to be the promised Messiah. Amen. Stephen's sermon at the time of his martyrdom was brought forcibly to Saul's mind and he realized that the martyr had indeed beheld the glory of God when he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. I mentioned earlier that God did not reject Israel because they crucified Jesus. Some of you may own the book Desire of Ages. I'm going to read to you from the chapter titled Priestly Plotting. This is a very, very important chapter. The reason it's important, and it's chapter 59, if you want to read it, I'm reading from page 539. The reason that this is important is because, do you know the title of the chapter that precedes, that comes before chapter 59, Priestly Prophets? Do you know what the chapter is, what the topic is? Lazarus, come forth. I've never seen anyone resurrected from the dead and been dead four days. But I think if I saw that happen, I would be impressed. I don't know about you, but I think that I would be impressed by seeing someone resurrected from the dead that had been dead for four days. After they had seen Lazarus raised from the dead after he had been dead for four days, the religious leaders of Jerusalem get together and that is what the author of the book Desire of Ages is writing about in the chapter titled Priestly Plottings. Just going to read one paragraph. In this council assembled to plan the death of Christ after they had what? Seen him raise someone from the dead after they had been dead for four days. The witness, the Holy Spirit, was present who heard the boastful words of Nebuchadnezzar, who witnessed the idolatrous feasts of Belshazzar, who was present when Christ in Nazareth announced himself the anointed one. The Holy Spirit is present there. This witness, the Holy Spirit, was now impressing the rulers with the work that they were doing in plotting the death of Jesus. Events in the life of Christ rose up before them with a distinctness that alarmed them. They remembered the scene in the temple when Jesus, then a child of twelve, stood before the learned doctors of the law, asking them questions at which they wondered. That's a nice way of saying they couldn't answer his questions. The miracle just performed, what? What miracle just performed? The raising of Lazarus. Raising Lazarus, a man from the dead that had been dead for four days. The miracle just performed bore witness that Jesus was none other than the Son of God. In their true significance, the Old Testament scriptures regarding Christ flashed before their minds. Perplexed and troubled, the rulers asked, What do we do? There was a division in the council. Under the impression of the Holy Spirit, the priests and rulers could not banish the conviction that they were fighting against God. How patient has God been with you? You don't need to answer. Hmm. 
Just like Jesus put obstacles in the path of Saul to prove that the direction that he was fitted in was not the best. God puts obstacles in the course that we choose when we have made a poor choice in our lives. And he does this until we die. Hebrews 10, 26 specifically addresses that. I'd like to go to Friday's portion of my study this week and read to you Statement quoted from Acts of the Apostles, page 124. It's a very interesting illustration. I'm going to read just the second paragraph. Okay? Page 12. Quote A general slain in battle is lost to his army, but his death gives no additional strength to the enemy. But when a man of prominence joins the opposing force, not only are his services lost, but those to whom he joins himself gain a decided advantage. Saul of Tarsus, on his way to Damascus, might easily have been struck dead by the Lord, and much strength would have been withdrawn from the persecuting power. But God in his providence not only spared Saul's life, but converted him, thus transferring a champion from the side of the enemy to the side of Christ. Does Jesus know how to recruit people, specifically how to get your attention? I want to focus on the term, a man of prominence. Do you think that Jesus was a man of prominence? Prominence? Huh? Yes. Really? His character was exemplary. Absolutely, he was a man of promise. But he had to develop that under what circumstances? Persecution. <laughs> yeah. Horrible. What was, what made Jesus a man of prominence as far as God is concerned? Did he come into this world like Adam and Eve did? Yeah. Created an adult with full... No, no, no. No. He came into this world the way that you and I do. Born through a woman. Was his mother a sinful person? Yeah. Yes. No. According to Scripture. What are we to understand when Jesus says in John, John 5, 19 and 30, I of myself can do nothing? Or in John 14, 10, I do not even take the initiative to open my mouth and say anything. What's so prominent about a person like that? As far as the way that the world considers prominence. The void of self. Pardon? You understand self. And what did he do with self? Hey. Submitted to the Father every day. What? Submitted to the Father every day. That's what the word obedience means in the Greek language. Did you know that? Upakoi is a Greek word. It means submit or subordinate your will to a greater power. I'm just talking grammar here, okay? Mm -hmm. Not inventing anything. That's what the word obedience means. Jesus was a person of prominence because he came to this earth to ethically and legally save the human race. And he took upon himself my <coughs> sinful nature so that he could give evidence of what God can accomplish through a person 
that has submitted or subordinated their will to God's will. And in so doing, he took the enemy within himself, his nature, and did what? What did we just read here? When a general is, loses their life in the battlefield, it doesn't give any great advantage to the other side. But when a general turns and joins the enemy, now what happens? He has made the former, in this case his nature, what has he done with his nature? He's turned it over to his heavenly father. And now he should become a person of prominence to each one of us that have the same nature that he came to what? Conquer. And that's why when you read the Bible, you'll find that the word sin, S-I-N, is used more as an adjective than as a verb. At a ratio of three to one almost. Look it up in your concordance. Don't accept anything I'm saying. Why? Because we just got through reading that the author of the book that we're studying for the next 14 weeks became all messed up because he listened to the what? The religious leaders of his day. And God is going to hold each one of us accountable for what he has inspired to be written here. That's why I refuse to participate in opinion sessions about biblical topics or speculations. And that is where all the problems arise. The author of the book we're studying for the next 14 weeks chose to depend on what the religious leaders had told him about the resurrection, etc., etc., etc. If there, are any, if there are any attorneys here, there, an attorney would say, it depends. <laughs> That's how attorneys answer all questions. You ask the questions, it depends. And that's the correct answer here. Are you a person of prominence? It depends. It depends. It depends on what? You. Romans 8, verse 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. What does that mean? The word enmity means it's a war. What did we just read about a general that defects and joins the other side? The carnal mind is enmity against God. So there's a war going on here, right? And it's not subject to the law of God. Continue Romans 8, 7. And even if it tries, it cannot be. That's a bad scene, isn't it? So just like Jesus got the attention and recruited Stephen on the road to Damascus when Stephen was headed to Damascus, Jesus reminded him of what? Did you see? Do you remember Stephen's behavior while he's being stoned to death? Do you remember that? So, he did. When you and I recognize Romans 8, 7, that's us. That's the condition that we're in genetically. In fact, God says the same thing in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is a deceitful thing and desperately... Well, the word wicked in the Hebrew means incurable. Look it up. Don't take my word for anything. Look it up. Incurable. So what is the solution? We need to defect from our position and choose to become a person of prominence for whom? Christ. For Christ.
Does Scripture tell us that that's possible and what the results are? I just quoted to you Romans 8, 7. Take a look at, well, we don't have time. I don't remember the bell. Two verses later, Romans 8, 9, and 10, Paul says, But you are no longer under the influence of the enemy. 